Many thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, where the Osage Nation is, I, I should just, and Jim will correct any mistakes I make here, I hope, but I should just say that by the time that uh, European Americans first began moving into the middle of the North American continent, the Osage Nation had been settled for a long time near the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, concentrated, I guess, in what is now really Kansas, Missouri, that region. But in the 19th century, the United States forced them off most of their traditional territory and into what is now Oklahoma, where the nation is located today with its headquarters in the town of Pawhuska. And Jim Gray was elected principal chief of the Osage Nation in 2002. He was the youngest chief uh, of the nation in a century. His personal, his background professionally is in public relations, journalism, publishing, and related fields. He was elected as principal chief on a platform of reform, a platform of change relevant to this class, with a particular concern, I think, with the fact that only a minority of the then approximately 18,000 Osages were able to vote in tribal elections because of the peculiarities of, the, of their history with the United <clears throat> States. He served as principal chief from 2002 to 2010, I think it was, eight years, and oversaw a dramatic transformation in the organization of the nation. Since then, he's worked for a number of other nations, either in senior positions or in a consulting role using much of his experience during those eight years as principal chief of the Osage. So with that, Jim, we'll turn it over to you and many thanks again for joining us for a while this morning. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I've been uh, uh, a huge um, fan, if not better word, a uh, supporter of this um, Native Nations Institute, the Harvard Project, the work that they do. Um, it has been a, an enormous um, gift for me to be able to contribute to the work that you do by having me on. It's, uh, I consider it an honor. Um, I do feel a certain uh, bit of anxiety over this issue today because um, <clears throat> as I've told my folks, uh, you all earlier that uh, the lightning struck my house a couple of nights ago and wiped out my computer. So my files are all, you know, lost to the netherworld. And uh, so I'm going to try to wing this presentation as best I can. I've given it before, so it's not like first time, but it, it will be um, a little less structured, I guess, than, um, than what I intended to do. And Miriam, I hope that you can back me up when needed uh, with the slides that you have on file uh, with the PowerPoint. And, um, you know, it, and I want to just say on the outset that if I hit Hello? You're back. You're back. Okay. If, uh, if any of you have a question, just wave your hand and get my attention and then we can, uh, I could address a question if you have one. Uh, it's, um, I know sometimes I go over a lot of material and a lot of federal laws and it gets kind of deep in the weeds, unfortunately, but uh, if there is a question that you want me to further explain, I'll be happy to stop and do that. Um, secondly, um, there's a, uh, uh, at the end of this presentation, there's a, I, I want to have some time to discuss uh, something that's going on with our tribe right now that's more contemporary, and that's the um, um, a multi-million dollar film is being made about the history of our tribe uh, based on a book that was written a few years ago called Killers of the Flower Moon. And if any of you have heard of it, it was uh, um, about a series of murders that occurred on the Osage Reservation in the 1920s. And uh, Martin Scorsese is going to direct it. Leonardo DiCaprio is supposed to start as well as Robert De Niro. And production is going to start in Osage country next month. So the pandemic put us off for a year. So if there's time, I'd like to tell you a little bit about that and how it connects to this overall presentation, because I think there's some important um, points of interest that I think should be part of this presentation, I think that will make it worthwhile. Um, so with that being said, does anyone have any questions going in? 
Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you, Steve, for that uh, kind introduction, as well as the uh, summary of how we got to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. law passed called the Dawes Act. And the Dawes Act was designed to break up Indian land holdings, specifically in the area of Indian Territory, because unfortunately, there was a move to move Oklahoma to a state, uh, Indian Territory into a state. And um, the way they saw fit to do that was to break up the communal land holdings of the tribes. And uh, the Dawes Act was created at a time of the end of the Indian Wars and the settlement of these lands on reservations and the closing of those reservations. And, uh, and there was an isolation period that really resulted in uh, some devastating economic policies on the tribes, as well as a great loss of cultural identity. which is to um, replace our stricture old governments to make them a little bit more uh, Americanized, uh, colonialized, even with limited authority. And um, so by 1906, the United States Congress realized that the Osages, when they arrived in Indian Territory, acquired their land by the sale of their lands in Kansas. So they had fee title to it. They actually bought their reservation. Because they bought the reservation, they weren't moved here by treaty. This gave them a little bit more protection in terms of property rights and property interest, despite the fact that there was this massive move to try to encourage the tribes to willingly give up their communal land holdings and break it up into individual allotments of 160 acres. In that process, they were allowing white settlement to come in for any unassigned land, surplus lands as they called it. The Osages, having fee title, was able to negotiate a separate allotment act that only dealt with them. And in that, pro in that act, the tribe retained the surface rights in the communal land holdings while uh, allotting only the surface lands. This was a unique um, act by the Congress, but it recognized the tribe's territory, but it also recognized the tribe's inescapable conditions that they were in, that this, this tsunami of change was coming whether we wanted it or not. Um, and so when Theodore Roosevelt signed Oklahoma into a state, the Osages had successfully identified 2,229 original allottees, as they called them, by a census. And then they allotted them their land, but in respect to the subsurface where there was oil and gas drilling already occurring, and other forms of mining that the tribes were to receive an equal share of the royalties that were built off those activities. Now, no one saw this turning into anything significant, but what ended up happening was is that the Osage Nation was sitting on the largest field of oil in North America at that time, but nobody knew it. And so as people started hitting wells right and left and started hitting gushers and they started making money. More money started coming in, more people started coming in. The companies known as uh, ConocoPhillips, where they were two separate companies, one established themselves on the west side of the state and the other one established itself on the east side. Sinclair Oil established itself on the south side. All these major oil barons that we know today as Sinclair Oil, Conoco, Phillips Petroleum, they all got their start drilling Osage oil because it was so prolific here. We, at one point, the Osage Reservation was responsible for 10% of the nation's oil supply. And this was right during World War I when it needed the oil to manufacture the, the machinery that went into that war. And so it was an enormous windfall of money that came to the Osages as those royalties started to increase with each quarterly payment. And if you were to adjust those payments for inflation, um, a $15,000 payment for a quarter for a royalty adjusted for inflation is worth several hundred thousand dollars today. 
they were getting those checks every quarter for several years at a time. And so when you think about what a dollar bought you in those days, say $15,000 was a quarterly payment, a car, a brand new car, a Model T would run you about 300 bucks. A house, you know, um, a starter home would run you about $2,000. When you start putting it in terms of what that money bought you, you realize that this was an enormous windfall. So I'll come back to that issue in that period of time in a minute. But um, as it turned out, the Osages became the wealthiest group of people in the world. And that drawn every dark element in society into our community. And um, the, the newspapers from both coasts would come in and they would see an Osage living in a teepee in their front yard with a mansion behind him. And they would take a picture and all of a sudden it became part of the, uh, the story that the Osages were wealthy beyond their means and uh, quite frankly, didn't deserve the money they got because they didn't know how to spend it. And so the US Congress came in and said, well, we'll appoint guardians to handle their money. And I'll just stop right there and move on. As time went on in the 30s and 40s and 50s, what happened was is that the 1906 Act set in stone who an Osage was. They established the principal rights of those original lotties and tied it to the property rights of those head rights shares that came as a result of sharing the wealth of the mineral estate of the oil and gas activity. And as you can imagine, they closed the rolls at that point. And they, through federal policy, not law, federal policy, they recognized that any descendants of those were to receive their inherited shares. So uh, if there was two original lotties living in their home, that would at the death of those two parents and it continued to fractionate on over time so with that being the structure the 1906 act didn't stop there they went ahead and created a tribal government for that the indian agent at that time abolished the old tribes constitution started uh, imposed this new structure that came in the form of the osage allotment act which if you research it, section nine of the Osage Allotment Act didn't just stop with the allotment of surface lands or the designation of a mineral estate. It went on to say, okay, and now the tribe's gonna be governed by an, an eight member council with a chief and assistant chief and their powers are to approve oil and gas leases and go home. That was it. There was no governmental power, no authority was granted to them they made um, a substantial contribution to um, the wealth and the, and the image that was created by the mainstream society that these Indians had no governing power. And, um, and what they did with that limited authority that the 1906 that gave them was that they were to pass resolutions and that's all they could do. They could pass a resolution to say, um, we like this oil deal. Pass a resolution saying, we approve of these allotments to go to these individuals. Because that was one of the things that the tribal council was in charge of was the distribution of the allotments, which was set in the 1906 act of those surface rights. There was 2,229 tribal members and each one of them got 160 acre allotment and that was their homestead allotment. Then they went through and allotted 160 acres and called surplus allotments. And then they kept on allotting until they allotted every square inch of the one and a half million acre reservation. In that process of allotments, they were granted a 25 year lifespan in other words, from 1906 to 1934, that was their lifespan. And then the trust relationship would be severed and be gone. That was it. That was only, that was only, that Lotman Act had a lifespan of 25 years. And, and so 
during that period of time, the Osages didn't know because the clock was ticking what they could do with the land, what they were going to do with their homestead, what they were going to do with the surplus. And as you can imagine, as was true with the rest of the states, tribes whose lands were also allotted like this, uh, a lot of loss of land on reservations occurred um, at a pace unlike anything you've ever seen in the world. And uh, all a storekeeper had to do was to extend credit to an Indian and let them charge up more than they can afford to buy and then go to the BIA and say, hey, he owes me money. Was, well, he doesn't have any money. Well, let me just have his land. So this kind of practice occurred all the time. And, uh, and unfortunately, it resulted in enormous loss of land. Uh, the federal policies of kill the Indian to save the man that created the boarding schools caused a gap in cultural education that uh, moved children, Osage children and other Indian children from around the country to these boarding schools in places like Pennsylvania where Jim Thorpe grew up and um, the famous man's world and they didn't fit in the Indian world. These sort of things caused a, not just a, 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 a cultural genocide of sorts, but it also caused enormous social problems that resulted in high rates of alcoholism and suicide and various other problems of lists of things that you don't want to be on. Unfortunately, it was um, identified in a report in the 30s called the Merriam Report. And I think um, um, it caused a change in federal policy. And when the New Deal came in, uh, they recognized that there was a need to kind of restore some of the tribes across the country's uh, ability to govern themselves. And that's something that this course covers in greater detail than I can. But just know that it, the Osages were a tribe that was, in the footnotes, was exempt from that law. We were exempt from the... Uh, um, IRA. And one of the reasons why was because that mailed of uh, property rights to tribal government. It, it kept us in a stasis that we could not evolve out of. And as continued head rights fractionated out, as the things that were going on around the world was developing and tribes were reintegrating their tribal governments under these old flimsy but essential structures that helped them build their economies back up the osages were stuck like a captive eddy on a in a river circles just collecting their head rights and going home and there was nothing developing there was no evolution of the tribe's ability to recognize that we have systematic problems with health care we have an education gap we have all these other things these tribal councilmen knowing that any kind of reform that would change the constituency that put them in office could be political suicide. And the federal government saw this wasn't their issue. They didn't care. The Osages seemed to be happy with their head right checks. Why should we bother them by enforcing them to evolve? So moving forward to the post World War II era, Osages had started to get louder. There was a minority in the tribe called the Onos, Osage Nation Organization. And it was a, uh, a fledgling group in the 1940s and 50s that advanced the cause of recognizing that we eventually are going to lose original Atis and we need to get ahead of this. And they were speaking about this before I was born. And unfortunately, they never could... Um, amount the kind of political momentum that was necessary to bring these to the attention of the elected officials that were protecting the structure that they had inherited or was imposed on them by Congress back in 1906. So they continued to approve oil and gas leases. The Osage Nation, uh, all the easy oil had been drilled and made and all the big oil companies moved off to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf and all that. And so we became a, a market for medium-sized oil and gas producers. And these folks were trying, you know, uh, experimental drilling techniques and uh, they needed a large area of land to be able to develop it. So the 1950s was the, the Osage Nation became a uh, experimental place for 
uh, water floods uh, drilling or slant drilling or vertical drilling and things of that nature. And so we were able to maintain a high level of prosperity even during those days uh, because we were, it was hard to find a big piece of land that you only had to go to one entity to get permission to drill. And so that was be, we, that was kind of our thing in the 1950s, but still there was this growing voice of concern that we're not just an oil and base tribe. We've got to be more than that. Our language is, is we're losing full blood, fluent speakers every year. We're, our culture, our ceremonial dances are being less attended every year. Our, we've lost so much of our land. How are we gonna get it all back? Um, what possibly could we do to correct these trends? And so the 1960s um, ushered an era of civil unrest, as you all well know, if it wasn't the civil rights movement, uh, the voting rights or the anti-war movement or women's rights, there was a flood of changes that was sweeping the Osage issues into some individual cases. One of which was to allow Osage women with head rights to vote. Up until that point, only Osage men with head rights were allowed to vote. So policy changes were made the 1930s, let me go back. I'm sorry, I skipped this part. In the 1930s, based on the Miriam Report and some of the changes that had occurred as a result of that book that was written about the Osage murders, um, the, the Osage Tribal Council appealed to Congress to extend the life of the Osage 1906 Act and the Mineral State for another 25 years. And so we were able to um, make the argument that that the 1906 Act needs to be maintained and the Osage people need to still retain a degree of control or at least benefit from it in the way that it was originally intended. So they extended it again in the 1960s for another 25 years. And then in the 1970s, they extended it into perpetuity. They just quit extending. Um, but they also um, kept the structure in place. And so by the 1970s, that group, the Onos I was talking about, filed a series of lawsuits to bring attention to these inequities that existed in the tribe, because by the 1960s and 70s, it was becoming clear that half the tribe weren't even recognized as tribal members because their parents were still alive and collecting their head rights. In the eyes of the federal law, the only Osages they had a responsibility or had a trust responsibility to were the Osages with head rights. And so if you're a, um, a parent of an Osage kid who is culturally a full blood or is uh, practicing the ceremonial ways and traditions and the language of the tribe, as long as you're alive, that person in the eyes of the law is not considered Osage. And there were people that were full grown individuals but whose parents were still around that still weren't recognized. They couldn't vote, they couldn't run for office, they couldn't do anything. And, the, uh, and so you could imagine how loud the voices of complaining had started to grow by the 1970s. When they saw that human activity that was taking place on a national scale, Osei just started looking locally, looking inward and saying, could we not do the same thing here? Could we not call for the kind of change that was that we all recognize is needed. But that power structure was still not prepared to share power. They did not think that if you go and amend that 1906 act, then they could take it all away from us. That, that was just fear techniques, you know? And so there was always that, 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 that back and forth between um, change for the betterment of our people or fear of change that could take away things that we already possess. So these two dynamics would just go to war against each other throughout the 1970s and into the 1980s. And one individual was the named plaintiff in a uh, class action lawsuit of Osage shareholders who actually filed a lawsuit in federal court asking for the federal court to rule the 1906 act unconstitutional because by the time the 80s rolled around, the majority of Osages that we knew were Osages by blood were, it was like an apartheid. The, the, the ruling class of the 
So federal judge Ellison, a federal court district judge, James Ellison in 1990 ruled that the Osage 1906 Act was unconstitutional and imposed a government reform on the Osage nation that was oversaw by the BIA. And so I was part of that effort and uh, I was a young man, I was in my early thirties and I was with a uh, all Native American public relations and advertising agency in Tulsa. And we got the contract to do all the communication to the Osage people about what all this change was about. And so during those early days of education, uh, we did materials, videos, pamphlets, direct mail pieces. Uh, we did uh, an enormous amount of communication given the tools that we had at the day. This is all pre-internet stuff, but we did a And it was uh, voted on and approved by, I think, like 58% of the voters. And, uh, and we are, started holding elections under that structure. Unfortunately, the tribal council filed a lawsuit saying that we never waived our sovereign immunity to be subject to this change. The United States government was the, name, was the, was the defendant in the case. The United States government said, well, the Osage Tribal Council is an indispensable entity. And, but Ellison never allowed the tribe to voluntarily, voluntarily waive their immunity to be subject to this suit. So they appealed it to the 10th Circuit. The 10th Circuit back in, I think it was 1998, ruled that the Judge Ellison overstepped his role. The tribe, and, and I hate to say this because it was a good decision you don't want tribes to be subject to lawsuits without them waiving their sovereign immunity. So it was a good decision in that sense. But any momentum that we achieved through that new government in the national, they called it the National Council days in the 1990s, was going to be, a, it, it set us back in a terrible way. When that decision came down, that entire government was wiped out. It was, um, I wouldn't say it looked like January 6th, but it felt like it, if you know what I mean. Materials, legislation was being thrown in the trash and incinerated. People were coming in and clearing out their desks and um, the, that old government would grab whatever files they could and they threw them in their car and they drove off. I mean, it was crazy. And it was such a devastating blow. And then by the, in the 1998 elections, when they went back to the old tribal council elections where shareholders only voted for shareholders, um, the chief at that time had made the promise that he was going to fix this so that we could move on. Well, four years later, he never lifted a finger to fix nothing because he was in power. He was in control. And so was the council. And they inevitably resisted any kind of calls for change. And in that election, my parents, my dad had passed away during that period of time. And I was a shareholder. And, um, I ran for office in 2002 on the notion that this change is inevitable as a tsunami. And we could either be in charge of this tsunami or we could be a victim of it, but it's gonna happen because by the time 2002 rolled around, we had nine original allottees still alive. And there was a solicitor in Washington DC responding to Chief Tall Chief's inquiry in 1980 that was still on the files at our offices when I was chief that said when the last original AT goes, that's it. There's no more Osage Nation, at least as recognized by the federal government, because the original AT's were the basis of the trust relationship. And um, if there is no new Osages recognized under law, then you are effectively non-existent. And uh, nobody believed it. Nobody wanted to believe it. Well, why would they want to believe it? This is horrible. But the clock was ticking. In 2002, I campaigned on this issue of government reform. The entire council that was running for those open seats also campaigned on government reform. And as, as I would say, it was the biggest wipeout in Osage election history. We've been having Osage elections every two to four years in uh, going back to 1906. And 
rarely would you see any more than two or three seats flip in an, any election cycle. In this election cycle, nine out of 10 lost their seats. And we got in there and we all looked at each other and we said, you know, it's not lost on us that the only ones who campaigned on this issue were the ones that got in. It's not lost on us that we should take this as a mandate, that the shareholders, not all the OCH people, because they couldn't vote, but the shareholders said, we need to fix this. So let's fix it. And we looked at the 10th Circuit decision and the 10th Circuit decision, and in their opinion, also said that you're not gonna fix this through the courts. The only way you're gonna fix this is that you go back to Congress and introduce legislation that recognizes the tribe's inherent sovereignty to determine their own members, who they are, and their own form of government without taking away any head right from any Osage that's currently receiving one. So those three principles were what the Osage people gave us when we went out and had field hearings and started talking to them about, we're gonna do legislation, we're gonna do legislation to fix this. What do you want in that legislation? And the vast number of people were saying, that's great. We also, we also want to include the membership issues. Of course, that's the main number. We want to have our children vote right along with their parents in these elections. We want to be able to not have a government based on the, the morality of waiting for your parents to die, to be a member of the, of the tribe. And so in that regard, um, the message was get our sovereignty back. Don't just change the membership, get our sovereignty back. Give us the right to fix this for ourselves. So we talked to our congressman. We said that we've had these hearings. We gave them documentation of our meetings. And this was the overwhelming uh, response. And this is what we believe needs to happen. He drafted legislation, Congressman Frank Lucas, based on the input that we gave him. He made it public. He put it on his page and he asked for public comment. And he left it up there for like eight or nine months not seeing a lot of uh, negative comments, but a lot of neutral to positive comments being the predominant issue because we captured the issue that no one's gonna take away your head right with this legislation. Number two, your children can vote right along with your parents with you now. And number three, we get to design our government of our own, not taking the IRA or the Indian, uh, the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act versions of their you know, cookie cutter constitutions, we would draft one of our, of our own creation because that's an inherent sovereign right. That's not something that uh, we need Congress to impose a new government on Osages. We want to be able to have Congress step away and say, we recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Osage nation, design their own government. And so we went to Congress, we gave them that message. Um, it was amazing the kind of feedback we got. Um, Chairman Pombo of the House Resources Committee decided to conduct a field hearing in the Osage Nation. And five members of the United States Congress came and attended in person. It's kind of unusual because normally when you get a, uh, a field hearing, you get maybe one congressman and staff, you know. But uh, our case, we had Congressman Dale Kildee, who was the Native American Caucus Chair. Richard Pombo, who was chairman of Indian uh, House Resources, Frank Lucas, who was a sponsor of the bill, uh, Brad Carson, who was a congressman from the neighboring tribe and is a member of the Cherokee Nation. And, um, and it was uh, the, the fifth one was uh, um, Tom Cole, who was Chickasaw Indian, and he said represents a district on the western side of the state. And it was uh, enormously educational on their part. Um, we had young people give testimony saying that they could not uh, apply for college scholarships that were designated for Native Americans at OU and OSU and TU and other colleges around the country because they didn't require, they did not accept a CDIB card, a Certificate Degree of Indian Blood, which is a U.S. Department of Interior document given to tribal members who may be eligible for Indian Health Service benefits or eligible for HUD homes or something of that nature, federally funded things that are designated for Native Americans. What these college scholarships required was a membership to a tribe. 
And unfortunately, generations of Osages could not complete those forms of requests for applications for scholarships. And the inequity of that was born out of that 1906 act that your parents had to die before you could be eligible. And even when they did, all you got was a CDIB card. The tribe wasn't issuing membership cards to shareholders. You didn't even have, we didn't even have that right. And so the, um, the testimony from these young people really moved them. They realized that there was an error that occurred along the way that maybe it wasn't intended, maybe it was given the times, but the problem was, was that there was never a, um, an effective uh, resolution given the limited authority that the tribal council had to address the membership identity questions, the issuance of cards, the establishment of institutions of government that other tribes had long since developed over the years. And here we are in 2003 at a field hearing and they're recognizing the error of their ways and they said, oh my God, how can we fix this? What do you all need us to do? And the legislation that was before them said, make sure everyone who gets ahead right continues to get it, that no changes will occur to that process, but it's not gonna be used as a definition of who an Osage is. In fact, who is gonna decide who an Osage is from this point forward is gonna be left up to the Osages. What we had to go to the Senate and we had to go to the Indian Affairs Committee and uh, I have a, a very interesting story to say about that because it was uh, one of those moments where it wasn't scripted, you know, if you know what I mean, because usually when you go into the hill and you're operating on behalf of your tribe, you have a list of talking points, right? And you have documents that you present them and this is what we want, this is the, um, you know, the points that summarize what we're trying to ask for, you know, I already went through all that. And um, the, the chief staff director of the Indian Affairs Committee was looking through it and uh, she was like, well, chief, I understand what you're asking. I get it. I, 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 as a matter of fact, I, at, at a certain level, I, I completely support this. Now she's a staff. She's not the senator, okay? But she works for the senator to oversee what gets on their agenda. And so I said, what is it you what what do you what do you think's missing in this legislation and she was like um do you think you'd be open to us putting in the statute the structure of the tribal government do you think it would be good if we put some parameters over the tribal membership issue do you think it might be better if we embedded that into the legislation rather than leave it so open-ended the way it's written. And I was sitting in there and my entire council and assistant chief was with me in this staff room. And I, I looked at her and I said, with all due respect, man, we've tried it your way. We've done it for a hundred years your way. We're not here to ask you to come up with a new and improved version of your way. We're here to ask you to let us do it for ourselves. And the only thing that's preventing us from doing it is that 1906 Act. If you could release us from that section of the 1906 Act that defines who an Osage is, that defines how they're governed, defines who gets to vote, defines what powers they have, then we can do this for ourselves. We've always were able to take care of ourselves even before the 1906 Act. It's in our DNA to do this. It's just that we have to decouple this property rights issue from who an Osage is that defines who this government is, that defines who we are as a people. We haven't had to even take up these kinds of issues through our tribal government in a um, in hundred years. And she sat there and there was a deafening silence in the room. And she just looked at me and she's just like, you know, you're right. I, I do this, I caught myself, and I thank you for bringing this to my attention because 
we're in a we're in an era of Indian self determination. That's our federal policy, and all you're asking us to do is to give you the space to be able to do that. And I and I and I and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you reminding me that because that's exactly what this bill needs to say. It doesn't need any more fixing on our end. It already has the broad support of your people. The House of Representatives passed this unanimously. I'll recommend it that, that we do the same here in the Senate. And in the lame duck session of the 2004 election, after the 2004 election, uh, President Bush signed it into law on December 3rd, 2004. And the day he signed it, we had one original law T left alive. Now, I don't know if that solicitor's view would have been the prevailing view had we litigated that, but I'm glad we didn't wait around to find out. It was important for us to be proactive and try to establish the momentum necessary, the federal changes in law that allow us to actually reorganize the tribe. And so we had a big celebration. We invited Osages all over the world to come home. We rented out a big circus tent. We had singers come in. We had Osages from all over the world came back. And um, I didn't realize how much this meant to the Osages. I know how much it meant to me and my family, but I don't think I really grappled with how the other Osage families were dealing with this. When I saw thousands of Osages show up out of thin air, it was amazing. It was historic. It was a, a chill. I, you know, I just got chills, and uh, and I was asked to speak at that event, and I went through the whole litany of what I just talked to you in front of the audience, of how we had never abandoned the idea of sovereignty. We have never given up on this. We knew the federal laws needed to be changed. We never stopped. We never stopped. We just kept on digging and fighting and fighting and fighting. It wasn't something that I said in 2002 in that election cycle that miraculously made everyone change their mind. No, this had been started even in the, the 1906 act. The, there were definite Osages that didn't want this. They didn't want this diminishment of their power as a tribal government to be able to oversee these things. And um, so this, this notion of Osage sovereignty has never gone away. But to finally achieve it in 2004, and uh, begin that process of identification, um, of recognizing that we have, okay, I've got two years left on my term. We got to get busy on setting up a new government. And so we established a constitutional reform commission. Um, and this commission hired the staff. And um, I know Steve and Miriam know Hepsi, who was a product of uh, you all's good education. She came in at the right time when we needed her to help lead that effort of getting public, public engagement going, to get the conversations going, to try to think outside the box. Is there more than we can do? And as a result, we produced a constitution that is truly unique, to, uh, that unique in all the world, but is perfectly suited for us. It addresses the, the districts and our uh, municipalities that exist within the Osage Nation. It addressed our current strive for uh, reservation uh, establishment and uh, defining our territory. It establishes our one man, one vote, form of government, three branch government with checks and balances and independent court system. It identifies a priority of language and cultural and historic preservation, especially at a time when other people are writing our stories and putting them in Hollywood. We have a mandate for change and then making sure that our voices are heard in that conversation. We have a, um, a goal to be able to preserve the mineral estate, to develop it in a way that is responsible, that uh, takes into account the, the environmental implications of that um, development, but also puts a priority on the individual, that the health of the individual that lives and works and drinks the water of this on this reservation, they have rights to. And uh, we have uh, diminished the role of the BIA having command and control over Osage lives in a way that they used to enjoy for years without any consideration of what the tribe thought. 
And through the power of self-governance and compacting, the tribe has compacted every major function of the BI except the minerals uh, part, which uh, they are in negotiations right now to do that, even these many years later. It is a goal that has never really gone away. We just felt like we weren't ready for it. We need to develop our capacity. We need to have more conversations and we need to control how we achieve that management authority <clears throat> over this uh, natural resources, this, this asset that's worth a billion dollars still. And, um, and in the process of funding this new government, we had in the, in the years that I was chief, we opened up and built seven casinos. The seven casinos give us the tribe the revenues to fund our judicial branch, fund our congressional activities, fund the executive branch, fund uh, significant programs that help pay for education for Osages that wish to get a college degree. Uh, we fund people who want to get technical trades. No matter where you live, we'll fund it. If you can get accepted into a school that will provide welding or carpentry or electrician or coding, or you want to get a degree in arts and sciences and business, we'll fund all that. And uh, we spend about $10 million a year in education. We spend about uh, $10 million in providing funding a health benefit card. It's a debit card. It's loaded with, depending on how old you are, between $500 to $1,000. And it, you use it like um, you would at a, any place that accepts Visa or MasterCard. And it's coded to be only used for projects that the IRS determines are non-taxable. So this $500 benefit card does not create a tax problem for any individual that uses it. You could go to Walgreens and buy your pharmacy, but you try to put a bag of Cheetos on that purchase, they'll kick that Cheetos out. And they'll just let that one go through on the, the prescriptions. And so you can use it for well baby visits, doctor visits, whatever you, your health needs are. And each year it's reloaded with another $500. This helps reinforce the need to make sure that people feel they're included. For a hundred years, the, the message was is that if you're not a shareholder, don't even bother coming around. And uh, so we had to come up with some really unique things that I thought were significant enough to invest in because the general purpose was, was to bring us all together. Even if we had Osages living in California or Texas or Tulsa, Oklahoma, or even right here on the reservation in Pahuska, the idea was is that no matter where you were, you were Osage, and that mattered. And to prove it, not just your vote, but programs like burial assistance, is eligible. you're eligible to apply for that. That will help pay for your funeral. You have a scholarship for your kids or yourself if you want to go back. You have the health benefit card. And so... As time went on and I left office, we set in motion a lot of programs that helped restore that sense of unity. The cultural explosion that's been going on at the Osage Nation with the investments into our language and cultural preservation has brought people home in larger numbers than we had ever anticipated, more than we can actually absorb given the limited size of the structures of our dance arenas and our community buildings. So the last 10 years have been spent building larger community centers, larger dance arbors, and feeding more people and taking care of more people and bringing more people under the drum to, to dance and participate in the Osage ceremonials. So there's this swagger at the dances that I did not see 25 years ago of Osages speaking conversational Osage into a loud PA system and half that room following it and getting it and having the, the sense that we invested in all that simply because we changed our government. Our, our tribe had defined itself around oil and gas and royalty checks for a hundred years. And once we were and in, and given that, uh, that opportunity to come up with a brand new form of government all the priorities of the tribe changed. Priorities such as education and healthcare and cultural preservation, language preservation, getting our land back. And one of the significant legal land transactions took place about four or five years ago. Chief Standing Bear was notified that Ted Turner, 
who had bought one of the country's largest private landowners had bought a huge chunk of the Osage Nation for his bison ranch, 43,000 acres. And as, as you know, he's getting up in age and his children are taking over his affairs and they're liquidating all those assets that he built up. And so they put it up for sale. They want silent bids were issued out to the Osages and other landowners. And uh, the Osages came out ahead and was awarded the land. And um, combined with our other land acquisitions that we've developed over the years and inheritance from others who had left their land to the tribe, we have now become the largest landowner in Osage Nation. That was something that was not, that could not have been conceived 30 years ago. But it's only because once the tribes were empowered to govern and vision their own future, all these priorities that the federal government thought that they knew best weren't, weren't really there. That the Osages defined their, their nationhood in a completely different way that expanded their governance, expanded, as a matter of fact, the one of only two constitutional amendments that have been made successfully in the last 14 years since our constitution was passed was a marriage equality. And I have to say that my son with a group of friends led that effort to get the enough votes to change the constitution to do that. And, um, He's now become the, um, um, I think Out Magazine named him as the most significant contributor. They did an individual 50 state deal with who was the most significant contributor to uh, LBGTQ community in every state. And he was recognized as the one in Oklahoma having done, led that effort. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel good about it in a way because it's like, uh, who knew that Osages embraced this? And I knew even when he came to me saying, we should do this, dad, you know? And I said, I know, but it can't be led by me. It's gotta be led by the youth. They have to be the ones to take this on. And, um, and so he got a group of his friends and relatives and, and let's just face it, there isn't a family in, in, in the country that doesn't have some member of their tribe, their family, that's gay or, as, you know. And so if you love these people at all, why should the laws of the Osage Nation prevent them from getting married? And that was the, and he managed that entire effort on social media. And he got a huge, it passed 54% to 46 and uh, and so I feel I'm really proud of him that he he used the political process that has been put before him to make the kind of change <coughs> that needed to be made. Um, there was another thing that happened too that really stands out. Um, but but what I'm getting at, um, oh, this is what it is. Um, young lawyer, uh, she was a, she's in law school. She called me two years ago and she was doing a paper on the Osage government reform. She was going to school at OU. And she said, do you mind if I just interview you over the phone? And I said, sure. And um, so we were talking about this and we went through basically everything I, I presented here to you all. And she's Osage and she worked during the summers in between school um, for the Osage Minerals Council as a receptionist, secretary, you know, assistant, uh, administrative assistant. And um, she would hear these conversations in the other room and she would sit and talk with the other members of the Minerals Council from time to time. And, and a lot of those guys who were elected under that old structure because the Minerals Council, which oversees the oil and gas approval process are elected by shareholders still. So they still maintain that old structure from 1906. So they're kind of, you know, they're not completely on board with everything, but um, they're not opposing it either. So she's listening to these guys and she goes home and she talks to her folks and she was like, why are they, why are they still mad? You know, why are they still upset about this? And they, you know, and so her mom tries to explain it to her. And she, we ought to call Chief Gray, he'll tell you, you know? And so that's how that whole thing started. But the significant thing 
about all that conversation was, is that this happened in 2018 or 19, I can't remember when, but she says, I thank you for the time to talk to me about this. This is going to be a, a, a really good paper. I could tell already, you know, cause I'm real excited about writing it, but um, I just want you to know if it makes you feel any better, <laughs> that's the way she put it. If it makes you feel any better, I am 21 years old right now. And this is 2019. So I was like, what, six when all this happened? I don't have a living memory of not being Osage, thanks to you. Man, I just, I didn't know what to say. But it gave me confidence that the changes that we put in place are legitimately going forward without me. I don't need to be recognized for what we've done. I don't need that adulation anymore. It's because uh, it's not, it never was about me. It was about the tribe finally getting control of their, their, their past and their present and their future. And if I was the person who lit the fuse to make all that happen, I will gladly take credit for that. But let me be sure that that, that, that had already been in place. I mean, there were so many people doing so much to make that happen that uh, realizing uh, since I left office, I've advised other tribes going through this process, the Oneidas, uh, White Mountain, uh, Red, Red Lake, um, three affiliated. And uh, as your educators will tell you, um, it's very difficult to make that happen. Things have got to fall in place just right. You got to have the right people at the right time, the right circumstances to be able to make those kind of changes. And, and as badly as some tribes needed it and wanted it, um, they still didn't get it done. And, but that doesn't mean you, it, it's failure. It just means that the step continue, that the fight continues for another day. You never stop trying to improve the lives of your community through whatever means that you have available to you. And I'd like to, you know, our, our, our lobbyist that worked for the Osages, Wilson Pipestem, he said, you know, even though we have made all these changes, I don't want anyone to think that all those previous tribal leaders, those tribal councilmen that worked under that old structure didn't try as hard as they could to make it work. They did the best they could. But at the end of the day, it had to change. And everyone knew it. It was that nobody knew when the time was ripe for that. And I think the 10th Circuit decision probably triggered a lot of it in the 90s that made the Osages a little bit more conscious of it because we got a taste of what being in a democratic form of government was like, even if it was only for a few years. But it was long enough for people to get a taste of it and they wanted more. And so um, with that being said, um, Miriam, Steve, I think I'm done. <laughs> Does anybody want to kick things off with a question for the chief? No questions. <laughs> Steve, do you want to, do you have anything that you'd like to um, sort of start the discussion with? I have a, a couple of things, but. Um... I, I do actually. I don't Wait want to. Minute. Actually, we've got Shauna's got a question. She's jumped in, so you you jump in, Shauna. I've got some questions, but I'll wait. You you jump in. <clears throat> and Shauna, if you could just say a, a word about who you are first, too, so the chief has a sense. Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you for that presentation, Chief. Uh, uh, my name is Shauna Janvier, and I'm from the uh, Denisutlin Nation in uh, Canada, in Alberta specifically, Northern Alberta. And uh, I, um, I currently work uh, one province over in British Columbia. And uh, I'm really fortunate to be able to reside in my home territory of Treaty 6. I live just about three hours away from, my, from where I was born. Uh, so I'm really fortunate to be able to do that. Um, however, um, that, that so I just I just wanted to ask you a few a couple of questions maybe just one for now so I can give everybody else a chance, but uh, you you had mentioned um, uh, I just wanted to get some clarification on something. 
you talked about um, Lattes and uh, you talked about collecting head, head rights. Um, and I was just curious, um, maybe just for clarification. Um, so original Lattes, once, once they were gone um, from the Osage Nation, um, they would cease to exist. So would that mean that the land ceases to exist for the Osage Nation and it reverts back to the federal government or like how would that have happened if things had happened different? It's a good question. Um, there was a, a line of thinking by the Department of Interior that basically established the principle that as long as there was an original law T still alive, that the trust relationship would still be intact. And in 1980, he wrote, his name was Scott Keep, and he wrote a letter to the chief at the time who asked about that question. And his response was, when the last original law T dies, there will be no more trust relationship between the United States government and the Osage Nation, which would mean that our lands would revert back to private ownership subject to state jurisdiction and state taxation. And uh, that would probably be what would end up happening, I think. Um, is there somebody else who'd like to raise a question or Shauna, would you like to do a follow-up? Um, otherwise, I think we're off to um, other questions from Steve. So. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with a question. Um, Chief Gray, early on, you mentioned this tension between the desire for change and the fear of change. And I just wondered if, you know, that's a, that's a challenge that I think a lot of nations <clears throat> actually face because they've become accustomed to operating under a system that may not be, it may not operate in their favor, but it becomes the only system you know. Mm -hmm. And so you you're a, and you're not sure what the heck or will happen when we change it, right? And I was wondering, um, what, how did you all deal with that? Not only in the the large issue of of changing that relationship to the federal government, changing the the fundamental basis of being Osage, but when it came to things like uh, putting together a constitution. Um, was that a long process? Was it, how, how did you kind of cope with that fear of, but wait a minute, if we change it, who knows what will happen? There are two competing issues that were happening at the time the legislation was passed and the establishment of a government reform com commission. We had, by the time we established it, we basically had a year to come up with a, a, a form of government that um, we at least at that point on the, on the tribal council side agreed that it would be established by a referendum vote of the Osage people. And um, one of the first things that the Osage tribal council did after the legislation was signed is that we put in law, and uh, since at that point the legislation had already passed, so we were in fact the Osage nation governing body for all Osages, even though we were elected by only a minority. But with that legislation, in, in, in fact, in the law, there was a window to establish some precedents that the tribal council felt was necessary. One was that we agreed that to a resolution that we submitted to the BIA, we gave them a copy of our, um, of the legislation that was passed, just in case they didn't know it, even though they knew, we just want to make it sure that we formally notified that now that this law is passed, the tribal council has established a, a policy uh, through a resolution that recognizes that all Osages who are descendant of that 1906 act are members of the tribe in the eyes of the Osage nation and are subject to um, the benefits that come from that. And um, we also notified them that your current policy of Osages wishing to find employment at the BIA could only be achieved through Indian preference 
through either contracting or hiring is if they were by blood half or more. Now that was a federal policy that was put in place years before and they continued to follow it. And um, that ran smack into the, the public law 108-431, which was the Osage Reaffirmation Act. And since we get to define who an Osage is and not you, we're notifying you to change those federal policies. So by doing it that way, Steve, we were able to establish something like a foundation upon which we could justify including everybody into the government reform process. So when it came time to vote on a referendum, everybody got to vote, not just shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so it was a tricky move on our part because um, the, um, the, there was a lot of him hawing around, as we say back here about, you know, should we wait till another election go or should we do it now? You know, this is, seems to be moving kind of fast, guys. Don't you think it, we ought to slow down? And, and I just cut it off in a council meeting. And I just said, we've been waiting 100 years to do this. We've waited long enough. It's time to do it. And if we don't do it now, some of us may not get reelected to see this thing through. We might get a whole angry mob come in here and just completely torpedo everything that we did. Do you want that on your, on your watch? Or when given the opportunity to make this change happen, that we did everything we could to make it happen? And that view prevailed, but, it, but we had to debate it out, Steve. I mean, it was, we had to talk it through. And, but the fact that we set some things in motion right after Bush signed that bill into law, it established the expectation that in the eyes of the Osage Nation law, even though it was a tribal council government, we still recognize every original descendant of an original law T as a member of the tribe and eligible to participate in that process. It so sounds a little bit as if the fear of not changing kind of overcame the fear of, of changing. <laughs> <laughs> that was my view. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, the, the other question I, I just wanted to throw out was when it came to actually designing the government you now have, and you had this commission working, what, what, was, the, what was the process of consultation like with community? Was there a lot of back and forth? Was it, uh, were these things contentious issues about how to design it or what? I think... Um, they went in with the best of intentions to expect a conversation about, you know, democratic forms of government, traditional forms of government from the previous years of pre-1906 era. We ended up having to spend an enormous amount of time reassuring tribal members that no one was going to take their head right away. That occupied way too much of the time because that decision of protection of head rights was already done in the federal legislation. So, you know, we heard them out, but they kept worrying about it. The, the money issue was so top of mind. And you could understand, you know, that the, the fear of change is, is the fear of somebody coming into their wallet, you know, that we were going to redistribute the wealth of the Osages, you know, and, and that was never the case. We made that condition clear in the federal legislation. And so, as the, the hearings continued to occur weekly, we would have people come in and give testimony. We would document everything that they were doing through video and transcript. And we had researchers on board that would actually go back and do the research because there were questions about some of those people that were enrolled in 1906. Were they really Osage? Were they? You know, and uh, because there was a lot of debate over that internally in the Osage community that some of these Osages just jumped on the bandwagon because it was free land, you know, and you pay a corrupt federal bureaucrat off, you know, you might be able to get put on the roll and subject to a, a distribution of a head right. And so a lot of that was um, heard back in the days after the 1906 Act, they had hearings and they did kick a few people off, but for the most part, uh, they didn't do a whole lot. And my wife, who at that time wasn't my wife, but you know, we, we got married years later, but she was doing research 
for the Government Reform Commission. And one of the things that she found through her research was that there was a significant number of Osages that were eligible for enrollment and to be put on the rolls, but the BIA refused to put them on, even though their brother and sister was being enrolled. The reason was is that they did not live on the reservation. They lived in Tulsa. They lived in Ponca City, or Pawnee, or Nowata, or Bartlesville, people that were just outside the boundaries of the Osage Nation. They would not recognize scores of Osages that were eligible, but they wouldn't put them on. So uh, my wife at the, uh, actually went to the commission and said, look, <clears throat> here's the thing. There is evidence that people were enrolled that shouldn't have been, but there's also evidence of people who should have been enrolled but weren't. Now, are we prepared to take on that issue of opening that door both ways? And do we have the adequate resources to process each one of those individual claims in a way that would be fair to everybody? And if you don't have the patience to go through it, and if you think so much time has been under the under the bridge that maybe water in the bridge is that maybe we don't want to do this. You know, you have to make that decision. So the commission made the collective decision that we're just going to accept the folks that are enrolled as they were in 1906. We didn't want anything to stop the process because if people thought they were going to get kicked off the rolls because we put it in the constitution, chances are they would have voted against that constitution if they thought we were going to put people on the rolls that hadn't previously been receiving a head ride or any part of the connected to the Osage tribe, but through some old BIA records, they weren't ever enrolled, that might delay the constitution from being approved. So the goal was to try to get the constitution approved. And once we got it approved, it could be amended. And if there was a chance that, that we could eliminate and streamline that process by, um, not putting everything that needed to be addressed in the constitution, that maybe that would be something that future Osage governments can address if they felt the need to do that. Things like marriage equality. <laughs> I never would have thought that would have passed, but it did. That, that's really interesting. Thanks very much. So Shauna, is your hand up again, or is that another question? Great, thank you. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Jorgensen. Uh, so Chief, could I just have a quick question um, just from um, the conversation that just occurred. Um, were, are there any um, current circumstances uh, where an individual who isn't a direct descendant of the tribe can ever attain uh, membership to the tribe? Uh, no, they would have to either, um, they could marry into the tribe but their descend, their children would probably be the only one eligible to enroll. Now we did have a situation back in the 1990s. And um, I don't know if y'all remember Operation Desert Storm, which was uh, the first Iraqi conflict in Kuwait. And um, the general that led the armed forces of the United States and all the other European allies was a guy named Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf. And he gave an interview on 60 Minutes shortly after that conflict was over. And he said he always thought he was part Osage. And uh, all of a sudden the nation's media attention came to Osage and said, is it true Schwarzkopf's a member of the tribe, you know? And, and of course uh, this, the chief now, Standing Bear, was the assistant chief back then and uh, for another for the tribal council and he said he went to the council and he said uh, we have no way of recognizing him and, and and it would just embarrass him if we told him that no he's not a member of the tribe let's do some ceremony put a war bond on him. he's a war hero for god's sake let's put let's do something for him give him an osage name and send him on his way you know and um and that's what happened. They, they invited him down to Pahuska. He came down with his entourage and there was all this national media attention. They put a blanket on him. They put a war bonnet on him. They gave him the Osage name and he jumped in the car and he drove off. And it was a, just a, that was it. Everyone went back to their lives. And uh, I had, um, 
after I left office and I went to work, I was the communications director and government relations director for the Cherokee Nation in 2011. And um, Elizabeth Warren was running for the US Senate. And you all know what happened there. She said that she had Cherokee heritage in her background and she thought, and of course the Cherokees took it completely differently. They had a completely different attitude about it. And I went and told them the story about Schwarzkopf. And I said, it doesn't mean anything. And besides, what could it hurt to have a Cherokee in the U.S. Senate, even if she isn't, you know? But over there, they have a completely different history of people claiming to be Cherokee than people uh, claiming to be Osage, where in Osage, it's kind of an odd thing. You know, it's not that big of a deal. But at Cherokee Nation, there's a long, tortured history of people claiming to be Cherokee that are not, that they have a knee-jerk reaction to it that is almost hostile. And uh, even when she ran for president, this issue didn't go away. It, it came up again. And, um, and so there was, um, every tribe's going to deal with this issue differently. But the, the idea that somebody could be uh, a, a non-member of the tribe and suddenly claim it, um, treat it for what it is, you know, uh, I just, uh, I, I always tease Jeff about it. I said, did, uh, did you give Schwarzkopf a head right? And he was like, no. <laughs> but that was it. Thanks so much for that answer, Chief Gray. Um, that's actually really interesting. Um, Donna Fay, you're next in line. Great. Uh, Say a few words about yourself too first so we know who you are. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Chief Gray. Um, I'm Donna Fay White Singer, White Mountain Apache from Arizona. Um, I'm a school administrator and also serve in a leadership capacity for our county. Um, one of the things in the story is uh, I think the difficulty in consensus building. So, you know, I'm assuming that, you know, when you started this endeavor that not everybody was on board and that um, it may have been um, a difficult journey in getting everyone on board. And I just think of our own tribal leadership and how um, making one decision that might not be, you know, as instrumental as this particular decision and how difficult it is to build that consensus. What was that like and how did you get to that um, point of consensus? I had, um, I made it a point early on in my administration My back? Okay. Um, so I, I embarked on a series of town hall meetings and, and, I, and I did it just because I thought it was part of my job. And, uh, and by doing that, I established a certain expectation in the community that whenever important events that were taking place in the tribe, both internally or externally, I would bring them out in the communities. I would go to our traditional districts and I would put food out and I would invite people in and I would talk for a few minutes and I'd tell them what was going on. And then I would sit and wait and hear what their responses were and try to assure them that we were uh, addressing the issues at the time. But when it came to government reform, it was a little different animal because instead of me doing that, we had the commission performing that function. Now, when I would um, hold my town hall meetings as chief simultaneously to these commission meetings that were taking place, people would ask me about, what did you think about it? What do you think about this reform effort? And I said, well, it, it's important for the people to feel like they have some ownership over the drafting of this constitution, what they want in it. And you don't really want the current chief being a filter between what your ideas are and what that commission needs to hear. I want you to save those ideas that you have for them telling me isn't, I'm not on the commission. We set this commission up to be independent because you don't want the tribal council drafting your constitution. So my goal was to clearly identify the area where I was gonna stay in my lane and continue to do that. So I knew there was hostility in the air. I knew that there was some organized opposition to the constitution. And I knew that there was a groundswell of support of people that were newly engaged and, um, and so I had one meeting in Pahuska 
where I wanted to talk to the, the non-shareholders. And let me tell you, that was an educational moment for me. I wanted the meeting so that they got to know that I, even though you didn't elect me for the time being, I am your chief. And I want to be able to, want you to know that you can come to me. That was the goal. It wasn't to rewrite the constitution or do anything other than what the commission was doing. It was just to make sure that for the, for this moment, I'm here for you. And you know how many people showed up? Out of a tribe of almost 20,000, five people showed up. That's never, and this is where I came up with my term, never underestimate what a hundred years of federal paternalism will do to a tribe. Those five people said that they overcome hostility in their own family just by showing up because they were afraid. They didn't know. They felt like they were being disrespectful to their elders by being publicly in support of something like this. And um, I learned a lot and I learned to be a little bit more humble and not be so aggressive about it. And I realized that people are in a special place right now having to confront this issue and do what's right but they have to have room to do it in their own way. And so it's a great question. I've never had that question before, but I have to tell you um, upon reflection, it, it was amazing that we got 67% of the Osages vote in favor of that constitution, knowing all the obstacles that were either manufactured or uh, placed uh, by accident in front of us with no intention to do that, but that's the effect is what happened is that we had to overcome an awful lot. And a lot of it was our self-confidence as a tribe, our ability to think that maybe we can handle this. Maybe we can, I don't know. We've never done it before, you know? And um, one other question that, that situation that similar to this is that I was at the dance arbor at our ceremonial dances in Pahuska and um, the leader of that ceremonial dance was a shareholder and he was served in our language program. He was a respected elder of the tribe. And we had just taken a break in the afternoon dances at my bench and everyone cleared out to go grab, get ready for dinner and all this stuff, you know? So it was just some people just milling about and visiting. And then Mowbray saw me sitting there and uh, on the bench and he came over to talk to me and he says, do you think this is gonna work? And I said, yeah, yeah, I think it is. I had my game face on, you know, I said, it's gonna be all right. He was like, we've never done anything like this before. What makes you so sure? And I turned and looked at him and I said, I looked at this dance arbor and I just said, because it works here. Are there, where are the shareholders seats in this arbor? Where are the shareholder songs? Where are the head right songs under the arbor? Tell me where those are. Are these camps, where are the head rights camp? There isn't any, because in this arbor, which exists totally outside of the Osage government, we don't make those clarifications. We don't separate ourselves that way. Here, we're all one big family. And if we can make it work here, and then I pointed up to the hill where our complex is, we can make it work there. And he just looked at me and he goes, boy, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. And he just walked off. <laughs> and, you know, so I, the, individually, these conversations took place in families at Osage homes all over the country. Conversations like the one I had with Mogu were probably happening every day or all throughout the tribe. And um, then I'd have these town hall meetings and sometimes people would show up, sometimes people wouldn't. But you never stop trying you know, and you never stop talking. You just, you figure out what's in here and what's in here and make sure it comes out here all the time. And you're always listening. You can make it. You, can, you just got to be able to not be afraid to put yourself out there and take on those, uh, those questions, those, especially those tough ones. Once they get that sense that you're not afraid, then they their self-confidence builds up a little bit in themselves too. Wow, that was a really powerful answer, Chief Gray. Thank you for that. And thank you for that uh, reflection on your experience. 
Um, you know, the story that you told about the law student calling you and um, sort of saying, look, you know, you know, my entire life in a sense has been a life that's been marked by being part of this nation and the reforms that took place. Um, that uh, is something that to me is linked to the question that one of our um, uh, students wrote in the chat. Um, De Janet Deshaney is a student in the Masters of um, Professional Studies and in Indigenous Governance program that we run and um, it's a University of Arizona program. And she's asked the question, does the Osage Nation have a youth council that is recognized by the Osage Nation Congress or our government? It's, it's dear to my heart. Um, I really wish the, the current administration would take up that issue. Um, you know, shortly after the constitution was passed, we embarked on a process called strategic planning. And, and the reason was is that the strategic planning was necessary to make sure that we got the constitution that we had all voted on. Now, and we have all these seven casinos operating and they're bringing in millions of dollars every year. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do with it? What are the, you know, the short term, midterm, long term goals of the tribe are? And so we went back out in the communities and we started having these. Um, we brought in somebody from the, uh, you might remember the organization, it was called the uh, um, CERT, the Council of Energy Resource Tribes. And uh, we hired them to be the facilitator of a series of meetings in California and Texas and Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, all throughout Oklahoma to get a, a sense of where people's ambitions were for the tribe. Now that you're a fully in, enrolled member of the tribe and you have citizen, you have rights, you have all this stuff, where do you want us to go with it? What do you want us to do? And we broke it up into six different areas, uh, education, uh, healthcare, cultural preservations, language preservations, mineral natural resources, economic development, and uh, um, rights, governance and rights. Um, the word escapes me at the moment, but it was just like ways to improve the rights of the individual and uh, the tribe. Uh, governance and justice, that was it called. And, um, <clears throat> and it involved every institution of the tribe, economic development boards, enterprise boards, the minerals council, the court system, the, the Congress, the legislative branch of the tribe and the executive branch and all their programs. And so they took all this stuff and we fed it all to them and they process all this information. In the area of education, one of the primary goals was to establish a youth council. And, uh, and I thought that was such a wonderful idea that they could come in when the Congress wasn't in session and sit in those chairs and you know debate issues that were important and pass resolutions and follow, learn Robert's Rules of Order and and you know just learn the mechanics of how it works and, and you know but nobody wanted to do it. I, I just uh, I think that we've gone through enough tribal leadership changes that some things on like I've talked about and some things are still just they, they're just not ripe yet and uh, I, I I really really wish that this would be something that gets picked up again I really do so I I think that underscores that um you know, some things happen kind of quickly. You talked about how fast some of that change happened after the bill, after the law was signed by President Bush and things just kind of went whoosh. And yeah. then you had those, you know, dozens of town hall meetings, you had the Constitutional Reform Commission was formed, the constitution was created and ratified. There was that decision about who could vote. Um, all this stuff happened really quickly. And then it, it also feels like then we've had this long period of, you know, 14 years or so where the constitution has been in place. and it's been a slower process of continuing the work, but in, in part, is that just because you're spending this time, I kind of sometimes use this phrase called living into the constitution. You've got to sort of live into it to sort of strengthen it. And then that opens up space over time for more to be done, um, like things like a youth council, things like that. I wonder if you can tell us some of those stories um, that might be about living into the constitution, some of those growing pains and how you got through, through them. I started this effort of establishing a TIPO, a Tribal Historic Preservation Office, early on. <clears throat> and 
it 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 had its early beginnings in my first term under that old tribal council structure, but it never really got going until after the constitution was passed and I was reelected under that 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 new government that I I had more power under the government to establish a department. <clears throat> and we recruited um, a phenomenal talent from the University of Northern Arizona, who was a, a doctor. She came back and ran that department from scratch. And we started adding on to it. She started applying for grants. The tribe started putting money into it. And it became a powerhouse of an organization. She recruited uh, tribal elders to serve as our elder advisory board that would review, you know, like section 106 consultations, NAGPRA issues, things of that nature. But it went beyond that. And uh, what was really, really impressive was that the, um, um, her desire to engage the tribal members into a series of conversations that she would set up through her program's budget that she would invite Osages to come to Pahuska. They would jump on a Greyhound bus or a chartered bus and they would spend two weeks in Arkansas, two weeks in Missouri, traveling to the ancient caves, the old settlements, the, the mounds that, that the Osages built years ago. And, and it was in designed to give them back their heritage that it, it was almost like a joke in a way that people didn't think the Osages existed before 1906 it had gotten that bad. The Stockholm syndrome of we're only Osage because Congress lets us be Osage was prevalent in the tribe. And her attitude was, is that, well, then we just got to change it one person at a time. And so she's been doing this for like 13 years. And she has changed in generation of Osages that have suddenly decided, wow, we do have a rich history. Wow. We do have all this, you know, and I give her credit, she's still there. And, um, and she tells me that uh, the interest in that, those annual tours that she does every summer is growing every year. So she's thinking about adding a second bus or a second tour, uh, but they take a lot of time to coordinate. I mean, she's got them mapped out for the next several years, but uh, uh, Miriam, that's one that I'm really proud of that has just taken root, but it, it just needed time to develop and ripen and, and and it falls so neatly under the Constitution's mandate for protection of our ancient history and our stories and, and leaving it us, up to us to tell that story, which is consistent with where the tribe is at with respect to this movie that Martin Scorsese is making about our tribe. You know, that the Osages uh, wrote a letter to Martin Scorsese, not the chief, but family members who were descendants of those people that were murdered in that book. And they wrote to him and said, um, this isn't Dances with Wolves. This isn't Last of the Mohicans. These, these are real people that you're gonna put on the screen and were their descendants. Now, I, we would respectfully like to meet with you, invite you to sit down in our traditional way, put a meal out, have you come and, and and let's talk about this. Let's talk about what this means. To, uh, it's important for us to be able to have an, uh, an audience with you because you're talking about our, our great grandfather, grandmother. You know, their, their homes were blown up. They were shot in the back of the head. They were poisoned to death. They were, all this is documented in the book. And we don't know if we're going to be seen as two dimensional victims of this story or are we going to be fully developed characters? that the audience is going to care about when we're killed. And there's no way you're going to be able to find out who these people are just by reading that book, because the author wrote the history accurately, but he didn't write anything about the culture of the tribe and our traditional ways and how women are treated and how we're not, women are not victims in our tribe. They were victims in this story, but it just goes to show how devastatingly damaging those federal policies were that were robbed of us of our ability to protect ourselves. The tribal council had no power to arrest anybody that was hurting an Osage woman. The tribe had no power to put anybody in jail for killing an Osage. 
The tribe had absolutely no power whatsoever to even protect the assets of those that were stealing from the tribe because of that guardianship program that the federal government imposed on the tribe. Millions of dollars went out the door through pen and paper. Some of it was taken out in the country and shot. Some of us were died by accidents. My uh, great grandfather, Henry Rome, is going to be one of the main characters in this film because his um, murder had occurred. And, and I attribute the tribe's current attitude towards sitting down with Scorsese and meeting with him to the fact that the tribe is feeling a little bit more empowered to protect their own stores. And Scorsese, to his credit, came to Pahuska. We put out a meal, we sat down and met with him. And um, the Gray Horse community was kind enough to invite me um, as a descendant of one of those characters, but not necessarily from Gray Horse, I'm from Pahuska. But uh, I grabbed the mic and I talked to Scorsese and I was like 10 feet away from him. And it's kind of hard not to notice that one of the greatest directors of our time is sitting there before you listening to you and everything you wanted to say leading up to that moment suddenly got stuck right here. <laughs> and, but I, you know, because I'm a little rusty, but I've still got the ability to, you know, rise to a moment. I, I, I told him that what I just told you, that the difference between this story and all the other treatments of Hollywood of Native American stories um, is that a lot of these are fiction. You know, the most successful ones were all fiction. Dances with Wolves, Last of Mohicans, Little Big Man. These are all fictionalized Hollywood versions of a, of a made-up story about Indians. This one's different because it's a, it's a crime story of crimes that were committed against Osages, and their descendants are in this room. And and with the budget that you have of almost $200 million, this is going to be the most expensive Hollywood movie about Native Americans ever made. And everyone in this room does not want you to fail. We want you to get it right. We're here because you can't treat this story like all these others have been treated. These people that are murdered, unfortunately, you're going to have to tell their story too, not just the heroes, okay? The, the FBI or the, you know, or the bad guys, you know, it's not just their story, it's our story too. And that story has never been told by Hollywood. Mr. Scorsese, you could be the first person to tell that story. This could be the story that Hollywood will finally look to and say, that's the one we got right. And that room just erupted in applause and Scorsese went back in his seat and his entourage all huddled in and they all had a moment. I got up and I handed the mic back and I sat down and he got up and grabbed the mic and he says, um, I'm on to your challenge, chief. I'm going to take your challenge. And I, I've got time. I want to go back. I want to work on this script. I want to see if there's anything I could do to improve it. I promise you, I don't want to make this movie unless this script's right. And I don't know what he changed. I don't know, but there's been a series of articles in the last few months out of the trade publications in Hollywood that tells the story of Scorsese doing an interview where he says he's moving the character from the, the white FBI guy who breaks the case. That was supposed to be Leonardo's role. Now he's going to be moved over to this other character. And this character is the guy who was married to one of the Osages, had kids with her, but ultimately his goal was to murder her. An individual and then kill her off, then they would collect half a million dollars worth of income every year, just in that one series of killings. And that's the story that he wants him to tell through Leonardo playing that role because somewhere in the court file, the, in, the, in the hearings that were held in the courts, he has a change of heart and he turns evidence against 
the mastermind of this killing spree, which is his uncle, because he fall he he realizes what a horrible thing he's been asked to do to murder his own family, and that is a historical record of what happened. He had a change of heart and he turned his testimony against um, his uncle, who ordered him to go do all this and participate in all this killing, and so that required a major rewrite of the script and eric roth the screenwriter who wrote forrest gump and a bunch of other movies that won oscars was doing a, a podcast for screenwriting and he was complaining about the fact that leonardo re rewrote half this script and it's no longer the story about how poor and devastating these osages are and how suddenly they became wealthy in this only through this this white savior that he was able they were able to not die off. With white savior narrative is what Dances with Wolves was, which is what Last of the Mohicans was, which is what Little Big Man was, which is every, go back in time and look at every positive Native American feature, there is a white person that saved the day. And so in a way, by having this movie turn into, a, from a white savior movie to a, 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 a character study, of a guy who suddenly becomes caught up in this scandal, this scheme of murder and killing, and then realizing he had a crisis of conscience, requires that you're going to have to build the characters of the Osage people up so that people will know why he had to flip, why he cared enough, which I think required him to rewrite the part of the Osage wife, Molly. And so this story is now taking on a brand new appearance. And uh, so much so that Paramount didn't want to make the film. And he ended up shopping it around. And thankfully, because ironically, thankfully because of the pandemic, Scorsese had time to shop it to the streaming services in Apple, who's building their own library of original content, took over the project and gave it an increase in its budget. So now it's like $220 million. And they, they're they starting to film next um, next month here in, in Osage Nation. And so it's like a, um, but I, I think what I'm getting at is that the Osage people have now felt the confidence to not just accept whatever Hollywood or Washington decides to do to them and feel like they have a voice in this matter and they're not afraid to express it. And um, I, I can tell you, it, it, there's a change in the air here that is um, forcing us, and just like before, forcing us to step up to the plate. Because whether we're ready for it or not, the attention that no sages are going to get from this is going to be like a tsunami. Because the book itself has brought tour, tour groups coming to Pahuska want to know where all the graves are where the Osages were killed because they read the book. This is number one on Amazon in 2017. So it's relatively fresh in everyone's mind. And if you Google Killers of the Flower Moon, there's a whole plethora of interviews that the writer had given. Uh, book signing in New York and LA and Europe and Texas and Tulsa and all over the country. This guy has been amazingly successful at selling this story and um, <clears throat> I I did not sign a release to be I, he did interview me and he did quote it, the conversation but he didn't attribute it to me but I, that was only because I was working on another project and I didn't want to I, I told him I was going to paddle my own canoe if it's all right with you but I didn't want him to fail because he was talking about my great-grandfather's death so I gave him as best information as I could so that he would get it right. And, um, and so when he sold the rights to the movie to Hollywood, he, you know, he says, I have no more control over it. You're going to, whatever Hollywood does, they're going to do. So I started writing some stories in the Osage News, Indians.com, Indian Country Today, talking about this movie. And maybe as a cautionary tale for other tribes who may find themselves caught up in a similar situation that they need to get their story right before somebody else tells it. And that's what this is all about. Uh, and when I think about the constitution, 
not being there for those tribal leaders in the 1920s when all this was going down, maybe some of those people wouldn't have been killed. When I think about the exploitation of this horrific story in our, in our tribe's history, being told on a national scale, an international scale, in movie theaters and streaming services, um, there's a conversation going on in Osages and they're, they're not really happy about it. Some of them are, pretty, some of the more younger aggressive ones are like, if I hear another white person come up to me and start telling me my tribe's history because they read that book, I'm going to lose it. You know, that that's kind of what's happening. But I think we're getting ahead of it. I think we, we're starting to recognize we have a role here of protecting the integrity of our own stories. If for not for the rest of the world to know, but for ourselves to maintain for ourselves. So I have a question for Steve in this, which is we do have two more questions from students and we're kind of at the end of the time we have had allotted for chief grade. Do we want to go ahead and raise those two questions kind of quickly and then take a break and go on? Steve, you're on mute. Uh, that's fine, Miriam. I'm, I'm not worried about the next chunk at all. So I think we should okay, do the good. questions. This is all wonderful stuff. Do we have a little bit more of your time for two more yeah. questions from students to wrap them? So Wangari, you're up. Um, thank you, Chief, uh, for all the stories. Um, it's really inspiring, especially uh, that Hollywood um, take. So my question is really just taking you back to uh, your experiences before and also working with other tribes. Um, what is the best way of uh, dealing with opposition uh, from your members of the tribe? Uh, how did you do that? Um, if you've seen it in other tribes, how did they deal with that? I was, um, I get that question a lot, as you can imagine, in some of the consulting work that I do. And, and you know, I, I don't attribute it to anything in, you know, specifically that I did that made a difference. It just that the, the timing was right for somebody to maybe put a voice to some of the things that people were already saying. Um, but I will say this, that um, the, the idea that in order for people to understand that, that what you're talking about is a solution to a problem, they have to agree what the problem is. And you have to spend a fair amount of time defining what that problem is. And in my case, we had that we had that lawsuit that was filed that demonstrated before the federal courts the inequity of the 1906 governmental structure was. So we had a basis of independent verification that we had a problem that needed to be solved. Okay, so maybe the federal court overstepped its role in mandating that we do a government reform. That doesn't mean that we were wrong in trying to reform it. What it did mean was, is that we need to go and change the federal laws that's preventing us from doing it now. So let's do that now. So in other words, I had the benefit of that most recent history to show the inequity of the structure, the need for change. I didn't learn about the, 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 the solicitor's opinion until after I got elected. That just freaked me out when I found that out. But um, but at that point, when it came time to just being able to make the argument, make the case for change, I had legitimate foundation of the federal courts and the Tenth Circuit Court saying, you know, you have, if you're going to make the change, you're going to have to go through Congress. You're not going to fix it through the federal courts. And so with that being the decision, then we went to Congress. So I didn't <clears throat> I telegraphed a mile away what my intention was if I got elected. And so that was my way of being able to bring the change about. In some cases, you know, every tribe's got their own unique obstacle they have to overcome. What helps, I think, is getting independent confirmation because if tribal governments are guilty of anything uh, or the tribal communities, in interacting with their tribal government are guilty of anything, is that we fear the conspiracy. We fear that there's unintended, there's a secret cabal at work here. There's a, he's just grabbing power. He's just doing this, you know? And you have to overcome that with facts and telling them the truth. 
And one of the best ways to get that is to make sure that the information that you're imparting can be verified independently. That comes from an independent source. And, um, and I think that has a lot to do with being able to persuade people who may be on the fence or reluctant to, to be a part of the change, to jump on board if they have agreed that, they, that there is a problem that needs a solution. Thanks so much for that, Chief. I'm gonna give the last question to Darlene Trock. So you're up, Darlene. Thanks, Chief, for um, sharing your stories with us. It's been great to listen to your experiences. Um, I just had a question around, um, like how did you prepare your leadership for the transition to your constitution? We didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it, which I think worked in our favor. Um, in June, the first Monday in June was the first election under that constitution. And the new elected officials weren't gonna be installed until the first Monday in July. So basically we had a month. Now, not to say I hadn't been thinking about it, but we had some ideas and some things that we wanted to put in place right away, appointments that we needed to make. Uh, we needed to bring in uh, the, the treasury and more importantly, the, the financial system so that they were not operating under that tribal council structure, but operating under one that was consistent with the constitution. Those were the, th the most immediate things, how we handled the money, how we handled the programs that up until that point would have to get on the agenda for the council to make any budget mods or anything like that. Uh, grant applications that required a resolution from the council no longer required that. There was only a letter from the, the chief's office that basically said, I support this grant application under our three branch government. We don't do tribal council resolutions. And so a lot of that stuff was, some of it came in, in bunches over time that we could successfully incorporate our necessary changes to. Others were just like slammed. I mean, it, it, it hit us almost immediately. We had a, um, we had a, a, a economic development board that and under the previous structure, tribal councilmen could serve on and they ran them, but they did not share all the information that was going on with that business with the tribal council, even though they were councilmen. So you could see the inequity that was caused by the old structure converting to the new because they no longer had a position on those board unless I appointed them. And since they were not so kind to share a lot of the information, I had to have some new people in there that were going to tell me the truth as to how these businesses were functioning. And so I made some series of appointments immediately for those that I was concerned about the most and turned out I was right. There were some folks that were committing some borderline uh, Medicare fraud in billing for health services that they were running as a private clinic under this business entity. And um, we ended up having to sue a lot of the principals and get judgments against them for mismanaging, misrepresenting uh, themselves to us, to Medicare, to all, I mean, they got all kinds of trouble, but I immediately had to deal with that. So we, we didn't get a lot of time for a, uh, uh, just kind of dip your toe into the shallow end of the pool. It was more like they just threw us in the deep end and says, you're, you're sovereign now. Good luck, you know. But fortunately, I had four years under the other structure to become acquainted with the, the emerging issues as well as the ongoing issues and prioritizing some of the critical things that had to be dealt with first. And, and we did that. Um, I'm sure at the time I was stressed out to the max about it. Now that it's 2021, I'm, you know, I remember doing that. Yeah. But I'm sure that if you asked me in 2006, whether or not I was Zen about it, I probably wasn't um, because I didn't know where the next, you know, brick was going to come through the window. You know, it was just like, we were literally drinking water from a fire hose of converting all our systems in place. And we made some mistakes, but we got a lot of things right. And where there was mistakes, we corrected them. And uh, so I, as I got more comfortable under that new structure, I didn't stress out as much over 
<clears throat> anything we missed or anything we didn't get 100% right the first time. Uh, it just became a matter of doing the job, getting it done and following the Constitution. 